It is my privilege to request our chief guest, Professor K. Srinath Reddy, to kindly deliver his convocation address. Esteemed President of JIPMA, Dr. Katoch, eminent members of the Institute body represented here on the stage and elsewhere, other luminaries in the audience, inspirational leader of this institute, Dr. Agarwal, distinguished faculty, meritorious medal winners, accomplished awardees of various degrees, who are worthy graduates of this eminent institute, proud parents, if they are watching anywhere, ladies and gentlemen, I like to say, Ellaruku Vanakkam. I would like to begin by congratulating all those who have completed their arduous scholastic journey and are being recognized and rewarded today. Some of you have received the degrees after recent graduation, some in a delayed degree presentation ceremony because of the delayed convocation. Nevertheless, the glint and glitter of the shining careers that you are building up will not be any way diminished, but will be greatly enhanced by the luster of the degrees you are receiving, whether you are already practicing your profession or just about to enter it. A glorious future does await you all. I would also like to convey a collective appreciation to the dedicated faculty who have devoted their time, talent, to mentor, motivate, and mold these graduates into proficient products that they are today. I also would like to offer a special thanks to Dr. Rakesh Agarwal for not only setting excellence as a norm to be achieved, but also exemplifying it in his own work. And I would like to thank Dr. Katoch, not only for the very gracious and generous comments he made about me, but for the very sagacious counsel and guidance that he provides this institute, which will carry it to greater heights. Indeed, today is an auspicious day, as Dr. Agarwal said initially while announcing the sanction of the large number of new posts. Today is the World Humanitarian Day, where the contributions of health and aid workers is celebrated all over the world. Indeed, for health professionals, every day is a humanitarian day, because their life is dedicated to work for betterment of humanity whether it is health promotion, disease prevention, early diagnosis, effective treatment, rehabilitation, palliation, whether we are actually promoting and preventing or restoring health, I believe it is entirely a humanitarian commitment that guides this profession. Indeed, even as we are getting much more technologically oriented, and we are beginning to see innovations in digital health and many other technologies coming into the profession. The core elements of the medical profession or the healthcare providers remain the same, that is commitment to human welfare, and they cannot be dimmed by any obsession with technology. Indeed, if we look at what Charles Mayo said when he founded the Mayo Clinic, along with his brother, 
he said there are two objects of medical education. He said it is to heal the sick and advance the science. Both are very relevant, though he forgot public health. It is absolutely important for us to provide the healing touch to those who are unwell, but also advance the science to research, both in clinical medicine and public health, because public health has a tremendous role in promoting health, preventing disease, and even in organizing better health care. Indeed, when people ask me what is the difference between clinical medicine and public health, I tell them clinical medicine provides health in retail, public health provides health in wholesale. And that is because both of them are extremely complementary. Indeed, we do need to address the health problems of those who are afflicted, but we have a duty to ensure that they do not fall sick or they get the best health care if they do fall sick. That is why public health actually identifies and influences the determinants of health at the population level and tries to impact upon them through policy level interventions, system wide reforms, through programmatic action and community engagement. And there, I think there is an artificial difference when we try and divide the domains of public health and clinical medicine. Yesterday in the Lancet, there was a publication which said that 44% of all cancer deaths and 42% of all healthy years of life lost due to cancer are attributable to three major risk factors, smoking, excessive alcohol, and high body mass index, which are conventionally considered to be related to unhealthy behaviors. But there are many social and commercial drivers which are driving those behaviors. If we do not address them and only satisfy ourselves with a purely clinical response, However much we can enhance our diagnostics with better biomarkers and imaging techniques, however much we can amplify our treatment modalities in terms of radiotherapy, surgery, immunotherapy, chemotherapy, we will still be dealing with a cascading load of increasing numbers of people with cancer unless we address the public health dimensions. And even if you are only involved in treatment, and there's no reason why you should not have glorious careers as clinicians, giving excellent clinical care, you must understand that when people are not detected early, or not referred early, and they come too late for the kind of skillful treatments that you can administer, that is a system failure. And that is where public health comes into action in building better systems, particularly through primary care, which is much better at detecting. Also, if the hospitals where you're functioning have stockouts of drugs, have inefficient systems, do not manage good teamwork dynamics, then you cannot put your best effort and get the best results. So it is important to understand that what we call as public health which also involves health system reforms and management, is an important element of even delivering good clinical care. So those are issues that we must recognize as we see them as a continuum rather than as separate domains. Of course, we are also seeing an era of major advances and rapid transitions. Even in healthcare, the models are changing. From a physician-centered model, we asked for a patient-centered model. Now we are saying it should be people-centric, not just patient-centric, because we are dealing with people, whether they are in hospitals or in communities, or traverse the course between the two in a bidirectional manner. So it is no longer a paternalistic pattern of clinical care, 
but a participatory model of clinical care where we accord the needed respect to the patient and the families and make them, as far as possible, informed partners in decision making. We are also seeing team functions. No longer it is the glory, gl glorious clinician at the top who is doing everything. You need a team of people, both residents, nurses, technicians, a number of other support actors. And unless the team functions efficiently, the weakest link will affect the performance. And therefore, it's also time to dismantle false hierarchies, which actually put doctors at the top of the totem pole and then treat other participants in health care teams as relatively less important. We must enhance the team dynamics, and that is an important learning as you go along, whether in your internship or later on, that you have to ensure those teams are built. Now we are also seeing ambulatory care. We are seeing self-care, people being empowered much more or enabled much more with not only telemedicine, but also greater knowledge for self-care. Indeed, in the year where we are looking at the celebration of the centenary of the discovery of insulin, the greatest advance in the management of diabetes has actually come that after insulin is in self-care, self-care by diabetics, through their own home monitoring, their own care. So that becomes a very important element. And I can say as a cardiologist very clearly that the ultimate, the largest, the most effective coronary care unit is the community. Whether it is primary prevention or secondary prevention, or even primordial prevention, preventing the risk factors in the first place, it is the community. And therefore, the connectivity between the community and the healthcare facility has to be seen as a seamless one and not as separate domains of action. We are also seeing, as I said, digital technologies and other technologies coming in. We are seeing a much greater role redefinition for doctors and allied health professionals and others, different terms are used, not necessarily the best, task shifting and task sharing. But the whole idea is that we are seeing a rational reallocation of responsibilities and duties. And that builds a very good team. And that is something that we must learn to have. We are also seeing a health transition that's coming up in a big way. Uh, we have seen between 1990 and 2016, the burden of disease contributed by what are called pre-transitional diseases, that is communicable diseases, maternal and child health related health problems, as well as uh, also nutritional disorders, come down in terms of their contribution to mortality and disability adjusted life year loss. Whereas now, about two thirds of deaths and burden of disease are contributed by non-communicable diseases. But again, we should not make the mistake of seeing them in separate domains. They are so integrally related. If you look at COVID, for example, in this huge pandemic, who were the ones who suffered the most in terms of severe disease, required intensive care, or even succumbed COVID? People with comorbidities, most of which were non-communicable diseases, and if we did not detect these people adequately in the health system, if we could not even identify, when we said people with comorbidities would be prioritized for vaccination, and we did not know a large number of people who might have had these conditions but were never detected by the health system, that is a problem of segmenting our health system. So we need a health system which is capable of looking at health, not in a fragmented manner, but as a life course continuum. And that is something that we must, again, ensure. Now, we know that even in terms of non-communicable diseases, maternal malnutrition, early childhood nutritional deficiencies cast a dark shadow into early adult life by increasing the risk 
of early onset coronary heart disease, diabetes. So these artificial compartments that we have built, that, oh, these are nutritional disorders, these are infectious diseases, these are non-communicable diseases, they must give way, and the best place they give way is in primary care. And primary care has to be the foundational basis of a good health system. Of course, primary care has to be comprehensive. It has to provide both chronic and acute care. It has to provide continuity of care. But it also has to be connected bidirectionally to advanced levels of care, secondary and tertiary. Unless we can build that harmonious health system, we will be functioning in separate islands, and that archipelago will not succeed in providing a healthy society. So that is where I believe it's important that all of you must also develop that vision of what will make a healthy India. Indeed, in terms of one lesson that we have also learned is not to arrogantly assume that something is over and something will not occur again. We have seen that with COVID. A.J. Cronin, one of the finest novelists of the English language of the 1940s, he was a medical doctor. And he writes in one of his books, when he's asked by the examiner who's examining for a MRCP examination, what is it that you tell yourself before you start examining a patient? He says, not to take anything for granted. We took it for granted once the vaccines will come, COVID will go away. We took a lot of other things for granted. So you must ensure that you keep an open mind and do not take things for granted, whether you're examining a patient or trying to address a public health challenge. That is an important element. And indeed, the Surgeon General of the United States in 1968, deposing before the Senate and the Congress, William Stewart was his name, he said, now we can close the book on infectious diseases. And as though to punish him for his arrogance, HIV AIDS came up in a big way. And we have seen many other zoonotic pandemics. But again, we must also understand how these zoonotic pandemics occur. They do not occur at random. They occur because we have built conveyor belts. We have allowed viruses and vectors from wildlife to come easily into captive veterinary population and human habitat. And our rapid travel and transit have enabled the virus to move fast. Even the COVID, the virus basically travels with people and celebrates with the crowds. And we have to ensure that we have a, not only a technologically competent response, but an ecologically responsible social structure, which doesn't allow these kind of conveyor belts to be built. Now, you may say, why is it you are talking all these things to us? That is for the policymakers in other sectors. But unless you raise your voice as concerned citizens, as people who have the knowledge and who are seeing the impact of things that have gone wrong in other policies, they are not going to respond. So even though while you practice your excellence in your own clinical domains or in your public health areas, do raise your voice for policy change, which reduces tobacco consumption, reduces ultra-processed food production and marketing, which reduces deforestation, which helps to slow down climate change, because you are the people who are best informed about what the horrendous consequences of inaction will be. Uh, therefore, that is something that you should also look at. And certainly, the two things that we really require to bring into medical education are multidisciplinarity and health system connectivity. Now, if you look at basic sciences, it is truly multidisciplinary in every sense. You have computational biology, computational physics, neuro-cybernetics, you have all kinds of things happening there. If you look at clinical medicine, it's not just strength of your proficiency as a surgeon or a physician. You have to think about the cost of medicines, diagnostic tests, whether you do them sequentially or simultaneously. What is the incremental value of the next diagnostic test? You have to think of economics and ethics. All of these are important. And if you're a researcher, let me tell you, 
Some of the biggest grants that are being given world over now are the team science grants. And they always ask, whether in the team science grants or even some of the grants, where is the social scientist in your team of investigators? So you have to build partnerships. You have to bring in other disciplines. Because public health, again, requires a variety of life sciences, quantitative sciences, social sciences, management sciences. You have to build those partnerships. If you have them in your institute, fine. If you don't have them, build partnerships with other institutions so that you create that multidisciplinarity. And you have to be health system connected. You can't be an island of excellence without understanding that how the health system in the country has to be strengthened from primary to secondary to tertiary care and ensure that we reduce the avertable morbidity and mortality at every level of the way. Those are important as well. And we are now talking about universal health care or universal health coverage. That is also an important element. Your patient should be able to afford the treatments that you prescribe, or the system should be able to provide the treatment and not impoverish them for wanting to save their own lives. So the doctors will have to raise the voice for universal health coverage. A famous pathologist, Rudolf Virchow, was also the founder of the German Anthropology Society, and he was the father of social medicine. He said, physicians are the natural attorneys of the poor. So you are the ones who have every right to speak on behalf of the poor, because you see what poverty does to cause disease, what poverty does to aggravate disease, and what poverty does to deny treatment. So universal health coverage has to be something that you embrace, not as a charity to somebody, but because the quality of your own work will suffer if you do not raise that. That's an important element. So I've said enough. It's been a fairly long day. I must congratulate myself too. I was a little uh, uncertain about the invitation because uh, of a variety of other commitments, but I said I must come. Dr. Rakesh Agarwal has invited me. But more than that, JIPMER is an institution I have held in great esteem, even though I never had previously the good fortune to visit it, because its stellar reputation for uh, excellence in teaching and in clinical and health care uh, was always something that I admired. And I'm sure you'll have many more uh, mountains to conquer as you rise to higher levels of achievement. But I must also say, I felt a little gratified having come here, because if I could stand for two hours without suffering a vasovagal, that means I must be doing fairly well. And I thought, and, and, and I, but I, I thought, even if I do, I'm in one of the best institutes in India. I'll get very good care, it doesn't matter. So I would say that what you need you must say, why are you talking all these so many other things which do not directly relate to our clinical care? You may concentrate on your work, gain excellence in that area. But unless you are aware of the rest of society, rest of science, you will not be able to bring the best of your knowledge into your accomplishment. Yesterday, I think, was Janmashtami, so let me give you a quote from there. When in Kurukshetra, Arjuna is totally lost because he sees the huge army, including of his relatives. And he says, you, what do I do? This was a warrior was famed for his archery skills, for his sharp eyesight, who when asked to aim an arrow at a bird by his guru Drona, would only see the eye of the bird. Now that warrior is totally lost in the battlefield. And then Krishna has to show him the Vishwarupa, the cosmic appearance, and say, this is your role in it. This is your relevance, and this is how you have to do it. 
I'm, I'm only quoting a story to show that unless you see the big picture, you will not be able to position yourself in your own chosen role and perform to the best of your ability. So what you need to do as academic institutions is to develop T-shaped individuals. Those who have depth of excellence in some domains, but also have a breadth of exposure and sensitivity to other disciplines and a real world awareness. Those are important and I'm sure we will see JIPMA making great strides in that area. And you must be lifelong learners. Many of you have done exceedingly well already. A lot to be proud of. But the New Zealand rugby team, which won the largest number of world championships in rugby, had a motto. Better is never permanent. Better every day. So you have to improve upon that better every day. And for that, you have to be lifelong learners. I'm sure you'll do your alma mater proud and ensure that the gift of education and ethics that have been instilled in you in this institution will stand you in good stead as you pursue your future careers and you will serve India and the world in whatever chosen discipline you wish to work in and where you will emerge as a true leader. Wish you the very best.